is good. People on Zoom, I'm going to share my screen. You should be able to see this now. Tell me with your voices if you cannot. Okay, so uh, let's get this started. First up, uh, I'm going to be using just like a bunch of brushes and things like that um, that I tend to use. I've already got them on this computer. If you guys would like to access them, you guys are welcome to do that. Um, I'm going to have the URL up here on the on the screen. Uh, it's somewhere where you can go and download these. Um, and also you can download a bunch of, say, reference images, things like that that I've collected if that's what you want to work with. If you don't have, say, an existing uh, face or uh, anything like that that you want to be uh, following along with this. Um, it also has these exact documents that I've uploaded here um, in case you want to follow along with a ver the very same one. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, yeah, so if you go here, you'll be able to see um, a collection of, for the most part, sort of like film grabs that I've got. Um, they are from all manner of films that I've only occasionally actually seen. Um, but the idea here is, I'll, I'll walk you through these a little bit because I don't actually need to rush. Uh, so those would be under screen grabs here. Uh, and these in general are faces with pretty natural lighting. Uh, some of these will be exceptions to the rule, but overall I'm not looking at photos where people have, say, extremely vibrant, unnatural light sources. I'm looking at quite natural light. Um, I'm not trying to find the most high contrast images you've ever seen. I'm not looking for images where there's been a, enormous amounts of post-processing done to them already, where they have already been adjusted and tweaked and manipulated. So I'm looking for images that feel quite natural in how they're representing people. Even, of course, given the fact that, you know, all films are adjusted, there's color grading, there's all of that happening to them. Um, but this is somewhere where you can kind of go through if you're interested and take a look and find existing photos. You can also find any photo you want if you want to follow along with this. Um, but I do recommend something with a human skin tone, so not like an orc or something. Um, actual photographs, not digital renderings, not other people's art, not heavily modified. Uh, it, why would Word be open? Not heavily modified versions of e existing photographs or anything like that. Um, what I've got here is I have two particular images that I want going to be working on. Uh, the first one is the face reference. That's this lady here. Um, and this is the face I'm going to be painting, this angle, uh, roughly these features. Uh, and this is the lighting reference. So I'm going to be combining um, the way that the light and the shadow falls on this top face here with the kind of like uh, some of the elements of how the, how the light is colored and how that affects the skin tone and how the sort of bounce light happens and how these other particular elements of say the background color here come in and start to affect uh, the way light and shadow work on the character. Um, so it's often really useful if you have you know, maybe you have a reference of an actor or some someone like that, um, and you're going to be painting, illustrating those. Uh, it's quite easy to go, okay, well, I can see what they look like and I can just sort of, I can kind of fake the lighting, right? Like I can just change it. I can make that work. And like, you can, and you absolutely you can come up with good results that way. But a lot of the time it's best to use reference because reference lets you learn from examples. It lets you learn from what you're actually seeing instead of trying to make things up. And often when you have work that is, this is your phone, isn't it? That's so good. Uh, often when you have work that is like, you've got like halfway there, it's looking good. And then some, for some reason, you know, you'll be working on it too much. It gets kind of uh, smudgy. It gets kind of overworked. A lot of the time that is because reference isn't being adhered to. You're not thinking about what things actually look like anymore. And you've started making stuff up. Uh, we all make stuff up that's always important, but it's useful to be doing that kind of like very consciously and not just going, oh, well, I kind of know what a face looks like. How hard can this be? Um, so uh, for this demo, I'm just sort of going to run us through the stages of how I would go about painting this face, trying to stay in a realism space. Personally, you guys are welcome to kind of play around with that if you want to go a little more cartoony, if you want to do anything like that. But because this is a tutorial that's really trying to focus on the the realistic sort of light and 
shadow and color of the face, it often helps to kind of like keep at least a degree of realism alive in there. So uh, everyone's got their own methods of things like how do you construct a face. I'm not super worried about uh, what is going to be, I'm not gonna like kind of break down those sort of basic elements. But what I'm doing here is I'm just using a light brush and I'm just starting to sketch out the very basic shape. So thinking about the bottom of the chin, thinking about, and you know, I might go in and actually like mark these as I do this on, on my figure here, thinking about where the hairline is. Okay, maybe the hairline looks like it's kind of up here on her. Um, I'm gonna try and guess where those eye, that eye line is. So as I'm doing this, I'm really going in and just marking very roughly, where do I think kind of the base of the nose is? Where do I think the mouth is? With the understanding that because I'm working digitally, I can go in and pick up these elements and continue to move them around if I need to. Uh, so as I've done here, um, I can start to see places where, for instance, there's elements that I've already started to kind of make up instead of following my guidelines. So the chin line here uh, on, my, on my sketch it has ended up being aligned with the nose. And on this version here, it's actually aligned with sort of the top of the lip. So it's, it's really important to kind of be considering the ways in which you're already starting to deviate from what's happening with that guide and going, okay, what, how can I change that? How can I adjust that? Um, so some elements of that might use things like the lasso tool. So I might get this and just pick up that chin and bring that down a little bit as well. Uh, I might sort of really block out, okay, where does the top of the nose go? It's kind of up here maybe. Where is the ear? So there's always parts of the character, often hands or ears or something like that, where people are like, do I have to give them an ear? I don't want to have to draw an ear. Those things are weird looking. They've got like all these folds in them. It's very complex. Um, and it's really easy to accidentally go, okay, I'll, I'll do that later. That's a, that's a problem for future me to deal with. Um, and then future you comes along and doesn't deal with it because they're, they're still kind of putting it off. And by the time you end up going, oh God, my character doesn't have ears and this is weird. Uh, you've already made often some minor but noticeable errors about, say, how the anatomy on the face is working. Uh, so it's easy to want to rush this stage because, of course, uh, this is just some sketching. You guys know about sketching. Uh, you got you guys have been here before. This you're familiar with this. But it's actually really important to always kind of be observing, always be kind of like examining this reference. So as I'm doing this, um, half the time I am either looking at the reference photo itself or I am basically making a line and then glancing back. So don't ignore your reference, have it on the same page as you, have it be uh, have it be really sort of like something you are deliberately focusing on and kind of paying attention to and not just something that is happening uh, off to the side and occasionally you glance over and feel to stare. Um, so let's see, how am I doing here? Yeah, this is okay. So now I'm just going to go in, put in the eyes. You guys can work in any order, but what is important is that you're not doing details yet. So when I'm doing eyes, I am doing kind of an almond shape. Uh, and I'm not worried about if it's perfect because maybe I'm gonna need to go in and resize that anyway, or change it up, or just completely erase them. And if I was being, if I was trying right now to draw a really nice eye, and then I drew it incorrectly, uh, it's, it's a bit of a downer, it, it is a little disheartening. So it's really important just to go, okay, what am I doing? It's some squiggly lines. I'm using quite a big brush here. Um, so I'm not letting myself go into details yet. This brush is a little strange in that it kind of gives the, uh, if, you, if you try it out, it's in, it's in that folder. Um, it's not exactly mapped to the pen tip as you might expect. Um, and so you kind of get a sort of gestural effect that sometimes is a little unnatural, but is in some ways quite similar to actually working with uh, real tools. Um, and so a lot of this tutorial, uh, I would say, is in some regard kind of similar to working with real tools. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to emulate. Just sort of in this part of the tutorial where, where I'm going to be focusing mostly on how do you paint digitally as opposed to how do you use every single blend mode digitally. 
because um, of course we've gone over things like blend modes in previous tutorials and we've gone okay well we kind of know what those are you know even if you only have a sort of like i'm starting to learn about them um, understanding uh we know that those are a tool you can use and they, and they are excellent they're great for shortcuts they're great for applying life and shadow for instance things like that um but also sometimes they are a crutch and we kind of fall back on them instead of learning to look at stuff um so uh, i've got my sketch layer here that's bit, pretty much as detailed as i'm going to let it be i've made a new layer on top you always make new layers for any new thing you're doing um so on this new layer here i am going to go in and i'm going to start giving a little more detail but i'm still using this big brush i'm i'm really i'm really not worrying about the extreme details here but what i am going to start doing is i'm going to start finding the finding the shadows on the face and actually sketching those in but i don't do that by filling in the blacks i do that by finding kind of the outside of the shadow um so i'm going to be demonstrating this because it feel it, it's quite difficult to explain uh but if say we look at this sort of shadow on the cheek here um, under the eye, it is sort of this shape. So I'm actually going to be sort of sketching out this shape, but I'm not going in and actually uh, and actually coloring this yet. So I'm not doing any big chunks of dark or shadow at this stage. I'm just exploring, kind of adding where I'm going to put that shadow. This may come across as kind of strange. Um, it's certainly something that uh, you often don't do as much with digital painting. Um, it's done a little more when it comes to trad traditional painting, like oil painting, things like that. Um, that's where I first learned of it myself. Um, and I find that it applies really well to learning to paint digitally in ways that uh, kind of carry across traditional painting knowledge and find a new use for it. Um, so as I'm doing this, it kind of looks a little strange. That's fine. Um, and of course, part of it is that the shadows on this woman's face, they are not outlined. They are not a clearly defined linear shape. They are, in fact, you know, often quite diffuse. So you have to sort of start making decisions about where you think that shadow goes. And that's kind of difficult. Uh, and you'll put some down and then you will change your mind. And that is completely normal. But it's all about kind of starting to trust yourself and going, OK, if I was going to put down the shadow that is around her chin here, where would that be? Let's find out. Um, and as you do this, again, this is not going to look beautiful at this stage. It's going to look pretty, pretty odd, a little bit okay. But assuming the sketch underneath is decent, uh, you will be able to sort of start to see the overall effect emerge. So I'm still not going and coloring anything in. So I'm not doing this with anything yet because I don't want that. Um, I just want to stay in this still quite loose sketching stage, but I'm just adding the light and shadow in. And of course, as you're doing this, it is okay to make changes to your, your face, to your uh, whoever your model is. Um, I'm doing some accidentally because I'm doing this quite fast and talking while I do it. Um, but you guys, you know, sometimes you do something and it actually just looks better than the original. Sometimes you have a particular goal in mind for your character uh, and you want to try and achieve that by manipulating your end result, uh, whatever that might be. Sometimes your your uh, sometimes the photo you're looking at is really cross-eyed, not this one, but I've had that happen a lot before. Uh, and you have to sort of tweak that when you bring it into your work to make it feel like that's not the case. So as the artist, there's a lot of executive decisions that you end up making that are really uh, where you start to show through in the work uh, as, as the artist, as the creator. Um, and so putting down these shadows is sort of the first step of that, going, OK, uh, I'm I'm copying off a photo, but I'm not copying the photo. I am making decisions. and that is something that it takes a while to sort of get used to uh it means you're going to make some bad decisions that look kind of weird um it also means you need to stop making stuff up so uh it's really easy to kind of go okay no well i i know what eyes look like so i don't need to look at my reference image when i am putting down these eyes um or to go no i well i know i understand this part of anatomy i understand where the shadow falls here I'm familiar with this, and often that is actually where you find yourself getting really tripped up. 
because you've started to you've, you've stopped looking at the reference photo and you're pretty sure you know what you're doing and the thing is you probably do kind of know what you're doing uh this isn't to say that you're you're not capable uh but in order to sort of like really learn how to apply things like light and shadow and painting and to make them feel real and uh you know alive i suppose for lack of a better word uh part of it is just learning to put aside all of the all of the skills you've gained all of the sort of assumptions you've gained around how do i make a face look good how do i make how do i make this thing read in the way that i want it to and go back to the basics of just looking at stuff really good uh which does mean there is some fiddly erasing going on. Um, it does mean that you have to go back and go, oh God, I've forgotten about the shadows on the side of the face. Let's go back and add those in. Um, so I'm not going really complex with my shadows. In, in general, I'm trying to keep these shapes uh, quite sort of angular in some ways. Like I'm just using lots of sort of like little sketchy angular lines. I'm not trying to get the perfect curve of any of these body parts or anything like that. Uh, I'm not actually outlining anything, so I'm not saying here's where the nose is, I've drawn the nose in. Um, instead, I'm really going in and going, how does the light and the shadow start to shape the nose? And this is something that, yeah, at this point, it can kind of look a little odd. Um, sometimes you'll be like, well, there's multiple light sources happening here, and they give different qualities of light, um, and that makes it quite complex, absolutely. Do your best. It's something where you you kind of like start to get a sense of what is working or what is not as you go along further, as you work into it further. Um, but it's also these aren't lines that you are now going to be bound to and you have to obey them. Uh, so as I'm doing this, I'm pretty much going to sort of stop around the neck here. But even then, I'm making sure like where does the shadow on the neck sort of end okay it's, it's kind of a little bit to this side of the chin i'm making a decision not to let it go much further over to this side here because i want to preserve this sort of shape of the the chin so what's going to happen here is that when i add shadows these elements here are both going to be in shadow and this is going to create this nice space here where we can see uh this sort of like the the shape of the chin becomes outlined by the use of light and shadow. So obviously you you want to be kind of wary of doing that a little too much and then making the light feel like it's not real, but uh, it, it's useful to start to consider nonetheless. Okay, so uh, let's say that this is kind of what I've got. No, it's not. She doesn't have any shadows on her forehead. Silly me. Um, again, a lot of the time you you kind of discard shadow when you're sketching characters, and this is a good way to just sort of start to reteach this part of the design process to yourself. Like, for instance, there is a shadow that's happening here on the side of her temple. Um, and there's an area of highlights that's right next to it. And it's quite easy to miss this when you are, say, painting digitally and you don't have reference. Um, so as I'm doing this, hopefully this is going to help me get a sense of what I need to be putting, what information I need to be showing when it comes to my next step. And of course, you can continue to adjust the anatomy. You continue to go in and erase elements, uh, but you're not trying to sort of like shade anything at this stage. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and say, sure, this seems good. Um, one thing you'll notice is that I'm not zooming in at all. Uh, I'm, I might be using the sort of like lasso tool potentially to go in and maybe change the size of elements or something like that. But overall, I'm not going to zoom in. I'm not working in details. I'm working in the big picture. And the only way you can do that is by sorry, hiding this thing, uh, is, is by making sure that the big picture, which is off to the side here, the nice space reference, is actually still visible. So I've got my sketch. I'm going to make a new layer underneath. And this layer, I'm going to make my base background color. Um, 
So it's not going to be this background color that's this pale blue, even though that's what I'm going to end up putting for the background. I'm going to try and find basically what is the base color of this character. Uh, this is a little, little bit of a guess, um, but I'm going to go for, let's see, something yellowish. Um, this is a layer that I might then choose to lock and maybe put a little bit of gradient over or a little bit of texture over just to start to get basically a canvas to work on. So um, if you've ever watched somebody who paints in oil paints, you'll notice that they often have a sketch and then they start going over it and they start going like this. And they're starting, they're starting to build up this sense of texture in the background, even though it's going to get covered up. So I do recommend, particularly for, for like this demo, uh, pick something warm, not that warm. That's, that's vibrant, that's awful. Uh, but pick warm tones and start kind of like building up. Doing this sort of scribbly effect honestly works quite well. Uh, sort of the background of your character. I also recommend making your line art layer a, basically a neutral sort of tone. I might make it a multiplier and make it like a brown. Again, so it sort of feels like it's sinking into the background. If it is bright blue, it's going to be adding another color that I, I now need to contend with and need to think about how I'm using. If I'm making it a sort of orangey color, okay, cool, I'm, I'm working with those. I think that's kind of what um, is happening already in this character's color palette. Um, so at this point, it's quite tempting to go, okay, well, I'm gonna start coloring. I can see what colors my character's face is. I'm gonna start putting those down. Uh, but instead what we do is we make a new layer on top of our background layer. And we go, this is our shadow layer. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to color in all of the shadows we've just made. Uh, and what color will they be is going to, honestly, I'm, I'm going to start out by just making them a really weird sort of purple color because I can change this later. And it's really important to be aware that, yeah, you can change things later. That's always an option. Um, so I'm going to go in and I'm just going to fill in all of these shadows, which includes things like the shadow that goes over the eyes. Yep. Um, and I'm going to start blocking these in. For now, I'm going to be making these all the same color. I don't actually recommend using and sticking with a deep purple, um, but you can pretty much start with anything because you are able to adjust it, which again is one of the real blessings of working in uh, digital mediums is that you really have the option of going, well, here's my shadows. I've laid them down really clearly for myself. Uh, and I can now adjust them to make sure that they work best. So there are, are obviously there is a lot of benefits to working digitally over working uh, traditionally, like for instance, the fact that we can all breathe and this doesn't need to be a highly ventilated room. Uh, whereas if you work with oils, it kind of does, it kind of does. You need to have a limited number of people and a lot of good ventilation and you can't do it at your own house. So as I'm going in, I'm still using a really big brush, honestly. So my brush is this big. Um, this is also a brush that has a tilt function. So as you can see, as I do this, as I sort of like move my brush around, the white tip on the screen uh, rotates. This is great, so it lets me get angles. Uh, and again, I'm just replicating uh, traditional mediums here, like holding a paintbrush and then spinning it. Uh, but it helps, I think it helps sort of like your brain map to an understanding of what you're doing. And that is highly beneficial. So I'm going in, I'm putting in all of my beautiful little shadows. Um, I'm not worrying too much at this point about what's happening with the lights. I'm not worrying if it ends up looking kind of weird because it's going to, because this is the weird stage. Um, there'll be elements like the hair that are going to be a little harder to, to kind of figure out. And it's going to be quite tempting to go, well, these are the darker spaces in, in this character's hair, so I'll color them in. Uh, and instead, I'm trying to separate the hair into sort of perhaps into chunks. So she has some backlighting on her. So as I go in and put a little bit of shadows where I think they are, a little hard to see in her hair, um, I'm also just erasing into this. So I've got like what is effectively one solid sort of shadow layer here now. Um, and I'm going to get my eraser and I'm going to start sort of slightly erasing some of the areas. So this is at a sort of like a half transparency because I'm using it really lightly. But um, you could also just get your eraser tool and set it to like 50, 70%. 
Um, I'm going to find the areas where I think I need to pull back on some of the shadows a little bit. So if I'm looking at her face, um, there's some areas around her nose, for instance, where the shadows are quite dark. There's other areas where they have started to be a little lighter. Um, so I'm going in and I'm just trying to find out where they are. I'm not doing it too long. I'm, I'm just sort of like starting to feel this out. Cool, let's say this is good. Don't wanna spend ages doing this. You guys ought to be spending a bit longer and obviously this is a tutorial. So hopefully you would be, uh... I'm just reading this, I'm reading the notes. Yeah, um, just making sure there's no panicking notes. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so um, I've now got just the hue saturation slider from the image image adjustments tab. I'm gonna go in and adjust what color I think my shadows ought to be. Um, this is a stage where it's very tempting to go, well, I know about multiply and you can use the multiply tool here. Um, so the multiply tool basically takes whatever you've got. And if you set it to a sort of pale blue color, it gives you sort of a shadow effect. Um, this can be quite cool. Um, it can work particularly well for stuff like this, where you know, uh, you're trying to sort of achieve a sort of natural tone. So I could do something like this. Um, but I can also go in and try and just instead of having it set to multiply, keep it on normal and see if I can figure out by eyeballing it, by looking back at my reference and then looking at my own character, uh, what do I think would work well here for shadows? Um, so given that obviously I haven't put down colors yet, it can be a little hard to guess, um, but I'm gonna try something like this and then see how it goes. So I think there's some sort of blue tones happening in the shadows. I think her, the light sources that are off to either side here are, like this one's quite yellow, this one's sort of a white yellow, and I think what's happening in here is sort of bluey purple. So I'm now going to go in, new layer, and again, I'm going to start painting in some of those light sources I just identified. So on this side of this character's face, I think the lights are like a bit sort of like blue tinged. Um, I'm just going to go in and start filling those out a little bit. I'm not going to worry about this enormously. This is a layer that I'm probably going to adjust a bit as I go along. But again, I'm just sort of starting to get a sense of potentially where the light is falling. Uh, I could also have outlined the light in the same way I've outlined the dark. It's a little, it's it's usually a little less important. Uh, I think outlining the shadows is is overall more valuable if you only do one. Uh, but you know, you could use the same technique here. There's no reason why not. So as I'm doing this, I'm still trying to look at areas where is the light hitting the most? Where is it hitting the least? So I think on this character, it's hitting her nose. It's kind of hitting the upper side of her face. Uh, and in some other areas, it's it's there, but it's a little less prominent. Maybe I'm just going to give her short hair so it's not a big distracting shape on the side. Uh, and so I can also do the exact same thing, of course, with the other side. That light I feel is a little more sort of orangey yellow. Going to go in, gonna try and replicate the same thing. If I pick a shadow, if I pick a color and it's not working, I can always go change it because all that's on this layer right now is what I'm doing with it. So making sure you're always working on new layers. Uh, don't fall prey to the, oh, but I can just erase it. I can just control Z it uh, thing. So a lot of this comes down to going, okay, yeah, this, there's, there's a light in this color that falls across a wide spectrum of this character's face and body on the side, but it's not equal. Uh, it's much brighter in some areas than others. Um, and so of course I'm going back in and I'm sort of trying to figure out what those areas are. It's on her nose, but it's only very slightly on her nose, things like that. Um, so. I've now got, let's say, an approximation of this. Again, I could use layer, I could use layer adjustment tools for this. I could use something like overlay. Um, but I'm trying to paint using the true colors that I'm observing. And I think that's part of the fun of doing this sort of thing, is that you are trying to observe from life not only what the structure of things looks like, but the color of things. Um, and that can be a little tricky. So um there's another, there's always the temptation when it comes to, to digital art, of course, to kind of go, okay, I'm going to color pick elements. 
Um, I think that's great as a starting point, I, but it can't be the end point of you figuring out what color things are. As you can see, as I'm kind of moving this um, eyedropper tool over this character's forehead, I'm getting such a wide array of colors. Some of these are basically a purple. Some of these are like a bright yellow. And this is not super useful for me because I can't just grab what I think the general color of her face hair is. Uh, but I can kind of eyeball it on this side. Um, and the benefit of all of this stuff is that it doesn't matter if you're wrong. Because again, you can you can delete a layer, but also you can just paint over stuff. Um, so I'm gonna go, okay, well, what if I what if I think her forehead, her forehead's like kind of like it's pretty cool toned. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of start gently painting over some elements of her face with an approximation of her skin tone. And this does mean, yeah, I'm just painting over top of uh, my existing layers. So I'm now going to put this over top of my line art layer because I want to start painting on top of that. And I want to sort of like let everything start to become uh, quite similar in terms of like what's happening when I'm starting to blend and paint into this. So as I'm working now, I'm going pretty fast. Again, I'm going fast because it's a tutorial, not because you need to go fast. Um, I'm, but I'm trying to observe, okay, what's happening in the edges of the face? What's happening here? Uh, what's happening with the light and shadow? Where is there higher points of saturation? Um, the nose here is a little higher saturation than some of the other points, I think. So I might go in and explore adding a little bit of sort of brighter red to that. Um, whereas the forehead, uh, it is a little more desaturated particularly on this side here. So I'm just using the eyedropper tool constantly. So every time this circle pops up, I'm using the eyedropper tool. I just have my finger on option on a Mac and I have, I'm not moving it. I just keep that there and I just tap it constantly. And what this is doing is it allows me to pick up these areas and start to move them around. Um, and I also am going over to the palette tool and I'm just finding colors that I think might work. I'm also not being super picky about this. Because what's the worst that happens? I put down a color and it doesn't work and I need to go over it again. Uh, so the freedom that you gain through working digitally allows you to just do stuff fast and ugly. And I really think it's important to embrace that, whatever that looks like for you. Um, and of course, you can go back in and go over here and, and examine what colors are actually happening here and go, okay, there's cooler colors happening here in this space around the eye. Excellent, cool, I'm learning something here. Um, and even though I'm going over what I'm working on, even though I'm going over sort of the shadows I've put down, I'm still able to kind of feel that they're there beneath. Um, and I know that they're there. And I know I know where they are because I've actually gone in and sketched them out. Um, and it's something where, you know, you, you start to get quite a good sort of intuitive sense of, oh yeah, there was a shadow right here by the nose. I know this because I've seen it. I know this because I've drawn it. Um, and now I know this because even though I've covered it up with a couple of paint strokes, I can go back in and edit again. And that of course is part of the reason you kind of go through this entire process is by doing things like this, you do a lot of learning that you don't otherwise often get the opportunity to do. Like, what does it really look like if, uh, you know, where do shadows actually fall on the face? Particularly if you often use cartoony styles or you, you don't tend to do a lot of realism because of course um, realism is, one of the kind of areas that requires you to be able to look at stuff really well and, and communicate what you're seeing to a really high degree of quality that um, some other areas like say cartoons allow for a lot more le leeway, which isn't to say that cartoons are easier in any way because they're not, uh, but it does mean that if you have a face and it's realistic and it looks kind of funny, uh, it it is going to register as there's something wrong to a lot of people, whereas with cartoons uh, and sort of like less realistic styles, you start to get a sense of, uh, you know, I, I could believe that maybe that's the deliberate exaggeration that's happening there in this space. I could, I could start to sort of believe what the artist is intended is, has intended to be, has intended to make happen. Mm. You know, it's pretty good if I'm going this far and I'm not stumbling over my words. Uh, so I'm going to kind of like start kind of wrapping this up to this section. I'm going to briefly kind of come around and see you guys um, 
but I'm going to do a little more painting first. Uh, but in general, uh, this one is something where you end up with just the ugliest things on earth for a long time. And as you can see, I'm still using a really big brush here. I could go a bit smaller. I could get a smaller brush and start kind of trying to find some details. But right now, I'm not doing that because I want to make sure that I'm getting these key areas of dark and light and tone. I want them to feel like they work. I have to remember that, OK, I need to go back in and add things like, what's the lip color? Uh, these other factors. As I'm doing this, I'm pretty much never putting a, a full 100% uh, opacity brush down. So it, I'm never using a full just sort of like applying color. I'm always using brushes that have a little bit of flexibility there. So you can see what's beneath them. And I have a sense of texture coming through. I'm also doing a lot of painting over stuff and just sort of starting to go, OK, uh, how do I represent what I'm seeing in a way that is effective, uh, even if it's not totally realistic, which is often what starts to happen, where you go, well, uh, I'm making some decisions about where the light and the shadow is going to fall on this character's face. Um, I'm using a different brush now. Again, I'm staying quite big, uh, but this brush is a little less rough. And it lets me kind of feel out sort of some of these textural elements that could be happening here. Um, I'm also thinking about what am I actually seeing? I'm seeing some sort of greenish elements coming in on the face. So let's go find a nice green and start adding those in. Doesn't matter that these are going to look a little strange because, again, I'm painting over everything. Um, and now that I've kind of got let's say, a very fast, very rough approximation of my character. I'm going to add some eyes in. Um, it always looks like this. It always looks weird and ugly at this stage. Uh, and that is completely normal. But I'm now going to get a slightly smaller brush. And I'm going to start doing some more sort of precise painting. So again, all I'm using is a regular brush on a normal layer. Um, and I'm using the eyedropper tool constantly to figure out what it is I'm looking at, what it is I want to be uh, examining. I also want to start thinking about where on this image is pure black, where on this image is pure uh, white. So there's nothing, I would say there's pretty much nothing that's either black or white in my reference image here. Uh, there is a lot of things that read as black or white, like for instance, her makeup, it feels like it is quite close to black. Uh, you know, the, the pupils of her eyes, things like that. Chances are, if I went in with my eyedropper tool, that would not be the case. Um, and so I don't want to be using pure black or pure white for this sort of thing, simply because, again, I'm trying to sort of replicate something, something uh, that feels like it has a basis in reality. Um, So as I'm doing this, you can start to kind of go, OK, well, I've, I've lost some of these nice lights that are really defining the nose. Let's go back in and add those in. Uh, you do a lot of this sort of like filling around and going, OK, what, what will achieve the effect that I'm after? What is the effect I'm after? Uh, how, can, how can I do this? I might sort of zoom in a little bit and go, OK, I'm going to focus on the nose for a minute. Um, I'm going to find those shadows of the nose. And I kind of remember what they look like because I've been here before. I've done this before. I'm going to figure out what that shape of the nose is. Oh, her nose looks like this. She has a shadow under this part. She has shadows here. And this part of the nose is defined by this shadow on the edge. Um, so as I'm doing this, I'm now using just quite like quite uh, kind of like chunky brush strokes at a, with a smaller brush, but still quite chunky um, to start to feel out what am I doing here? What am I trying to achieve? And how am I kind of maintaining the light and shadow aspects within this? Often the hardest areas will be the areas where the light and shadow begins to blend or where two light sources start to collide. Um, and that's where it's really useful to just actually go, okay, cool. If I'm just looking at this woman's nose, what am I seeing? I'm seeing a hard edge that's along here. 
let's start to put that in. Let's find that on my character and illustrate that. And again, just remembering what color I'm gonna have for my lights here, a little bit bluish. And you can start going, okay, well, some of these shadows are kind of bluish. Some of them are kind of orangish uh, in terms of how they affect the skin beneath. Which ones do I want to choose for each area? Um, and of course, anytime you're not certain why something isn't working, I actually recommend just making a brush bigger. Uh, it forces you to stop looking at small details and it makes you go, okay, um, what's not working here? Uh, if it's not working, I'm simply going to cover it up. I'm basically going to be covering up and trying again, but in a way where it's not erasing stuff. So I almost never actually delete a layer here. Um, I always just paint over stuff, unless I've made you know a grievous error. Uh, but there's very few errors that are actually better erased than uh, just, just sort of painted in a way that helps you understand why you made them in the first place. So it can be useful if you get stuck also to go, okay, I'm gonna make my entire image grayscale. Uh, I've just made my entire page white. I'm gonna go down to saturation. And this one here is just gonna let me look at both my reference and my image and go, okay, what's happening here? What's working, what's not working? I can start to see areas where, for instance, okay, there's definitely not enough light on this side of the face. Now I can go back in, nice big brush again. I can start adding those in. It's useful to think of the face as having these planes. So there's, some, there's these sort of like uh, sort of like parts where your face kind of has a bit more of an angle and is not in, the, in fact like a flat surface. Um, and so starting to use these to shape what it is you're seeing can be really useful. The other thing I can do that is just for basically helping me uh, shape my character because, of course, my background color very similar right now to my foreground color uh, and my character color. I'm just going to start sort of scribbling in some stuff for the background. I could pick a different color than this, you could say, because this one's a little garish, but I'm just going to change that after I put it down. Um, and what this lets me do is it lets me sort of see, okay, what's working, what's not. I can use this kind of as a shaping tool to go in and adjust elements. And I can also use it as something that just gives me a bit of insight into large changes I might like to make. So I will quickly just change this to a color that isn't a little bit much. Da, da, da. Let's try something like this. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is, so I've, I've noticed that in doing this, because of course I'm doing this quite fast, um, I am, no, I didn't mean to close it. No, open it up again. No, give, give it to me back. Give me back. What? Why did you close? Sorry, guys. I don't need to update any text layers. No, thank you. Um, ah, there we go. Um, I have, this was not necessary. I opened a, don't allow, don't allow, stay out. Um, okay, what I've done here is I've just collapsed everything down to one layer. I have copied and selected this and I have just pasted this. Um, I now basically have one layer that has everything on it. I just want this. There's also another shortcut tool, but I don't know it on a Mac. Um, what I'm going to do with this is just start grabbing chunks and manipulating them. I love this bit, chunks. Um, so I'm just going to get bits that aren't working for me right now and start warp tooling them. Uh, this might just mean adjusting elements like these eyes. Um, it might mean taking this entire face and stretching it a little bit. Uh, this is also an element where you can start to sort of play around with if there's exaggeration you want to do, things like that. 
can just be fun to sort of do it here a little. Um, a lot of the time, this is when you start realizing, oh God, one eye is too big or things are at a slightly weird angle or I can't tell what I was trying to achieve with this, but I definitely am not doing it. Um, and the walk tool just really helps here. Just really sets you free in a way. And it lets me just, because because of course I'm working still with an image that is really rough. Um, I don't care if, yeah, I'm going to have some weird cut marks. That's fine. It's rough. Um, I'm I'm just painting this up. I'm not worried too much uh, about all those little details because I haven't spent hours and hours on this. I've spent a whole, uh, well, like half an hour on this or something at this point. Um, so of course you don't need to have the background layer sort of like in this, you could be working with nothing, but I'm doing this simply because I find it. A... Oh, you're good, you're good, so good. This is like everyone's dinner time and I'm super aware of that. So it's also okay if you need to eat food, by the way. Um, don't eat wet food or food that has a really strong smell or food that makes other people hungry. Um, so only unappetizing food that is dry. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if you have anything you didn't you didn't really want to eat anyway, then this is the time. Um, so I also can sort of if I have a background, if I if I have you know, a scene that my character is sitting in, I can start to think about the ways in which I might use aspects of that background color in this as well. So in this case, okay, well, the light off this side, it is kind of blue. I'm going to start integrating sort of aspects of that blue light in here. I'm going to uh, think about kind of what, okay, what color are these shadows over here? They are actually a red color. I'm going to go find that red. I'm going to put this in here in the ears. And I'm going to make sure that I haven't lost my nice, vibrant yellow lighting on this side of the face. I think I, in retrospect, I'm not going to try and kind of do the using both sort of like lighting references, uh, simply because I think it is going to take too much time um, and become slightly confusing uh, based on, you know, you guys not be able to see what I'm looking at directly. Uh, so I'm just going to stick with just, whoops. Just this lady for now. And begin. There we go. Um, all of these things, I can really decide what it is I want to do in terms of stylization a bit now. If I have elements I want to start stylizing, if I have uh, kind of like decisions I want to start making around things like this. Um, this is when I sort of start using some of the harder edge brushes or start kind of really exploring how I might use those. That could be in a variety of ways, but in general, harder edge brushes are nice because they just let you get a sense of uh, definition starting to come in. Um, so I'm trying really hard not to lose sight of where my shadows are. And I'm trying also not to lose sight of what color my shadows are in relationship to my other shadows. Um, so her, her upper lip here is, is lighter than some of the shadows around it, but it's still in shadow. So I want to find a way to capture this effect, um, which means I need to sort of be color picking constantly from what is around me. If I can identify the two shadows of the same color or the same tone, same saturation, uh, any of those elements, okay, cool. Color picker allows me to just grab that and use it again. It can allow, I can easily also start some adjusting elements of the character's expression a little bit now if I want to. Yeah, I'm making her look a little more stern. Um, obviously, if a big, big expression changes would be more complex, and I would recommend also having reference for those. But for instance, if I just wanted to start kind of like giving her a frown, if I kind of know what is already happening, then I can add some of these features in. I can sort of like crinkle her forehead, little things like that. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about that at this stage. But uh, of course, it's important to remember things like eyes. The white of the eyes is never going to actually be white. It's always going to basically be a sort of bluey, grayish, pinkish color. Um, you can use the color picker if you're not certain about what color that actually is going to be. Uh, so go in and find that and use that. Um, you can also go in and start kind of like if you need to find sort of where those lines are, find where those shadows are kind of 
starting to manually draw those back in um, and then kind of paint over them again with of course the idea that all of this lets you sort of feel out what is happening in the image. And sometimes it's just quite useful to go color pick from the original image so you can kind of see um, when I put this down, what tone is it? Uh, what tone is it in relationship to the rest of it? Because then I can start going over what I've just put down and go, okay, well, my colors are slightly different and that's fine, but I can see what tone it's meant to be and that's really useful. In general, you don't want to walk, walk, work. You don't want to work too small with a tiny brush and you don't want to be zooming in and worrying about like the exact details of like the lines of the mouth or anything simply because that all can come later once you have everything sort of felt out in the larger strokes. Uh, but some elements can be quite useful. I'm just thinking here about making sure that all of my shadows on this side feel like they are a little warmer. Um, this is also an area where you start to go, okay, what is happening with human anatomy? What is happening with the face? Where, where are the shadows actually darkest on her face here? That kind of alongside here under her chin. If I exaggerate this too much, I will age her enormously. Um, and if I don't do it enough, it will look fake and smooth and strange. And so again, it's a, it's a matter of really figuring out what that balance looks like for your particular character or person as well as for your photos. So I've just done something good on the chin there, as you can say. Um, all of this is going to look weird for like the first while. It always does. Um, and it's always going to have a lot of elements where in general, this takes me about three, maybe three hours to do one of these. So this is a very sort of like the fast and ugly version. Uh, you guys is also gonna be the fast and ugly version if you're following along directly with this. Uh, and so don't worry about that. That's really normal. So if something isn't working right, remember to go back to uh, just using a layer that looks at only at values and go, okay, what are they doing? I'm not. Um, and sometimes that is you've moved too far away from dark or light in a certain area. Um, and now this is unintelligible. Um, sometimes it is uh, a, a matter of anatomy. Something has kind of blurred or smudged and suddenly it no longer works, but you didn't notice because it was happening quite slowly for you. Sometimes you really narrow your character's eyes weirdly. Um, and sometimes this is a useful point to go back in and really feel out like, okay, what is the shape of her eyes? How can I ensure that these are reading correctly? Are they the same size? All of these little elements that it's easy to kind of distort when you're painting. Uh, everyone has sort of different painting methods. This one works better if you spend, the longer you can spend on that initial sketch, because of course we're not giving you enough time for that. But the longer you can spend on that, uh, the better the final result will be. Uh, as long as you're not spending longer than like a couple hours on it, I would say, like in general, it's not like it's, you don't want to be spending days trying to make that first sketch good. I would I would probably spend like maybe half an hour or so trying to make that first sketch good normally. And then I would start to build on that. Um, as you're doing all of this, take a look back at what your previous layers are doing. Uh, you could go back and grab your your previous, your first sketch layer and actually see what that looked like. Let me go find that. There we are. So I could take my first sketch layer and actually pull this up here and have a look and see how I have kept or not kept just certain elements. Um, something that may or may not be useful for you. But again, this lets you kind of see what am I ignoring? What am I distorting? Um, and I could now leave this layer up here if I wanted, maybe lowering the opacity a bit and actually just continue to paint with it freshly on top if I felt that I had been losing sight of what I was trying to achieve with my character um, and if I felt that my realism was starting to blur. 
So of course, all of this is not going to achieve photorealism in instance, in an instant. Um, and certainly, like, I don't tend to aim for the kind of like pure photorealism. I tend to aim for the sort of like enjoyable sort of middle space where you can still see it's a bit painterly often, uh, and it still feels like it is constructed, but in a way where that's the point. You're kind of like, you know, you look at art and you're like, oh, the joy is that somebody sat down and made this. Um, I think that's what humans can really bring to art and, and to kind of like creative spaces that a AI that can technically draw simply never can, which is that act of sort of like deliberation and the choices that we make, which is something you can really do pretty much at any skill level. You can make choices at any skill. Um, uh, and it doesn't matter if they're good choices, it just matters that you're making them. Um, and so always explore different brushes that work for you. Most people end up having um, a few different ones that they use on and off for different purposes. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I would say I probably have like three or four or five brushes max that I use. And you can kind of see what ones those are because they're attached in sort of the downloads there. But uh, everyone does stuff differently. So sometimes other people will do incredible effects with brushes that I absolutely can't stand and can't figure out how to use in enjoyable ways. Uh, so even if somebody is being like, this is the best brush ever, you don't actually, if, if you, it doesn't work for you, don't worry about it, don't do it. Um, same, same with all techniques. If I'm, if I'm showing you something here and you're like, this is pretty bad and I like this at all, that's fine. This is not, a, all these are not techniques you actually need to use. They are tools that we show you with the idea that some of them you'll like, some you won't, that's fine, that's normal. Um, it's also a last thing before I sort of start walking around. Um, it's useful to sort of think about the areas where there is pretty much no value um, differences between areas. So right here on sort of this chin space on this woman here, um, her neck and her chin are kind of blending together, pretty much the same color. Uh, and that means that we're losing a bit of a sense of her chin. So I could either choose to represent that or I could choose uh, not to. Um, and so if I choose not to, what I'm doing here is I'm just carefully trying to allow for her face to feel like it stands out and to feel like it uh, is clearly clearly delineated against uh, against her neck in particular. Um, and that is also something that's really important to be considering, of course, is the, the choices that you make around what you're going to put in, what are you going to keep, what are you going to exclude, what are you going to change? Um, nothing, there's nothing you can do that's wrong exactly. Uh, there's a lot of things that look bad, which is not the same, but there's nothing that's actually like a, a bad decision and we're going to come over and be like, oh, you idiot, look at what you've done. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, so don't be afraid just to try stuff out. And I think a lot of sort of digital painting is at its best when you're not afraid of just making a new layer and trying something, grab a random color, put it down. Cool, I think this, I think this, I think this would look good here. Okay, try it then. Uh, and of course, that there's a certain privilege to being able to have the time and the energy and um, the your, your your arms not hurting because you draw too much and all of that. Um, and of course, you're at university, so you have limited time, limited energy, uh, and we we do get that. But take advantage of it where you can when you do have the time and the energy and you want to learn stuff uh find okay i am back here um we have ended up running a little bit over time Okay, um, so I'm going to probably do the next half hour tutorial pretty fast. Again, this is a just like kind of feel free to just simply watch, hang out one because it's a photo comping one and those tend to be a little ugly. Um, but this is very similar. I'm just kind of going through the process of photo comping quickly in this case um, with some existing stuff I've put together and uh, doing a little bit of sort of like painting on top of that. That's pretty good.
That's pretty good. Uh, by the way, you guys should definitely please save the stuff you're working on here when you're done with it. Uh, and like take the time to like put it up on the Discord, things like that. Um, hold on to it even if you don't like it. Um, so what I've got here, I have, um, as many of you will be familiar with, here's my screen, here's my composite items. Um, and I'm gonna sort of start stacking them onto my character here. Um, so I've already cut out some of them, as you can see, like this one here. I'm using the warp tool to sort of help fit some of these elements to my character. Um, I'm doing this pretty fast. Um, I would take a little more care with it if I had a little more time, of course. But as it is, this is fine. Um, so I've got some little bits that I've cut out that are like, here's a bit of a cake. Um, and I'm just going to sort of start stacking these, putting these on my character and getting a sense of how they fit over top of an existing photo of a person. So with photocopying, please always use an existing photo or sketch, but a, a photo is really good because you, you haven't made any er errors in that photo yet. Um, just for anatomy, if nothing else. Um, let's see. So I've got sort of some composite cape pieces that I have stolen from a picture of a dress. Uh, this one, all of these assets that I've got here are from the Met Museum, from the Cos Costume Institute. Um, and they're fun. And I really recommend you look at them because they have so much great stuff for clothing in particular. And it's clothing from all throughout the ages. And it's, it's very enjoyable to look at and to kind of explore. Um, I'm also going to be just sort of adding in some elements that, like for instance, uh, instead of having the back of the cape visible as an actual piece of fabric, I'm just going to put that in back here. That's fine. I might use a little bit of a gradient to give it a sense of a tiny bit of texture or something. Um, I'm sort of compositing this put it together pretty fast, simply so that I can begin sort of the painting process on it. Um, so you can use things like the lasso tool to clip things out, but often it's useful to start with select and mask, which is um, being on the right layer for the object you want to cut out, going to the little dotted like selection tool, select and mask, select subject, which will smartly try and pick up the character. Yep, there we go. It got the object in the center. I hit enter and I now have it mostly cut out already for me. And I just need to go in and erase the bits I don't want. And this is very useful. So Photoshop has 10,000 techniques that nobody teaches you and you have to figure out by yourself. Um, and I do recommend if there's something you don't know, Google it. I didn't want that at all. Um, if you have this problem where, as you can see, it's been cut out using a masking layer. You want to just go to apply layer mask, right click apply layer mask, and then it'll be its own separate object, um, simply because this is faster and better and much more flexible. I'm also just gonna flip this over and around to fit sort of the shape of my character a bit better. Um, so when it comes to photocomping work, in general, work quite like fast and ugly to see if you actually like what you're making. I always recommend. Uh, and then once you have decided if it's good, you can then move on to making it look uh, exactly as you wish. Um, so of course, as you're doing this, these are kind of slightly destructive techniques. So I'm I'm walk tooling this entire image. There we go. Um, so you know I'm I'm going to be losing bits and pieces, um, but that's okay. I don't mind that. Um, I'm going to be kind of going in and filling in some of the spaces that I don't have a particular reference piece for, um, but I might just fill these in myself with my own colors. Uh, and then I could sort of start exploring, maybe I put a texture on top of those. I could get the texture from this guy's pants, for instance, pick that up, copy that, uh, finding my layer here. That wasn't what I tried to achieve. There we go. Um, I make this, I put this on top, 
nice and ugly. Right click and make it a clipping mask. And this is just nice and quick way of applying a bit of sense of texture, a bit of sense of what's happening with the cloth. Um, so I might want to try and line this up so it kind of feels like, you know, it it uh, it makes sense for like kind of the creases in the cloth. But I'm not worrying if it feels a little pasted together at this stage because it is pasted together and I'm going to fix that. Uh, making sure that you have the auto select box up here in the top left checked is really, really useful because that lets you just uh, select one of your thousands of layers that you've now got and uh, figure out where you want to put it by just tapping it and I can move it. Nice, easy. Um, use every shortcut you possibly can when it comes to things like this. Uh, it is it is so useful to be able to explore and adjust what you're looking at and whatever lets you do that quickly is a good technique. Um, and so there's lots of things like, for instance, whatever. Okay, there we go. Um, a, like small decorative elements from one object or one creature or anything like that can be quite useful when applied to other things. So you want to think about the ways in which you can cut this out slightly nicer than I am, seeing as I'm doing it very quickly for this demo. But uh, you know, can you use these elements decoratively? Can you use them uh, to kind of like say something about your character? Can you can you like figure out ways to kind of fit them to your character that don't feel like they're distorting the image too much, ideally? But uh, the trick is often that you know you put these things in. Yeah, they're a bit distorted. That's fine because you're going to go back in and paint over them anyway. Um, and often you're not fully painting. You're sort of painting into and sort of with them. Uh, but the overall effect is often still quite similar. So let's say that this is a little approximation of my character who looks like some kind of medieval jester. Um, I'm going to now play around with uh, gradient, not gradient maps. I'm going to play around with adjustment layers. So adjustment layers, super useful because they let you just change things without worrying about uh, making a bad decision. Although using this particular adjustment layer was a bad decision. Uh, so first I'll make sure that I, I, I figured out what layer I want to fit. It's these ugly pants. Okay. Adjustment layer. Um, color balance. I want to first right click on this and make it a clipping mask so that it only affects the pants, which are beneath it. And now I can go here and start going, let's see. Beautiful purple pants. Uh, Ideally, you guys, when you're doing this, maybe you have an idea of what your character is going to look like. Maybe you don't. That's fine. But regardless, uh, it is useful to kind of like give yourself a bit of freedom. So even if you're like, well, I know kind of what my character's color palette is going to look like. Um, cool. But see what see what looks good regardless. See what might work. These two elements here. Let's see. Um, so I've now selected both elements of the cape, and I'm just going to merge these layers together so that I can affect them both at once. Again, adjustment layer. Um, I could use something like uh, vibrance, which allows me to sort of really emphasize whatever sort of like those colors are. So I'm now making it much more higher saturation. Um, as you can see, I'm also making everything else in the image the same. So I want to make sure that I have it set to be a clipping mask. There we go. Now it's this lovely vibrant blue. Um, I can do this for all of my little comp composite pieces if I need to. Some things might be fine as is, but it's always good to explore how you can, in particular, affect them in ways that make small adjustments that help you kind of bring the colors of the character or the scene or whatever it is together. So everything here, I'm going to just make sure that I'm bringing it all sort of into this slightly sort of purplish space um, with sort of these warmer highlights. I can also do the destructive version, which is just going to image adjustments um, and then selecting from the exact same stuff. Again, this is perfectly fine. 
but when I do this, I can't undo it other than literally control Z or using the history tool. What are we looking for in here? You can use things like hue saturation, which allow you to sort of slide everything. Um, it's a little, a little clumsy in that, like say, it distorts the shadow colors as well, but it can work quite well. Oh, I'm really going for ugly gesture here. That's a shame. Yep. Word. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a preserve function, but I. Yeah, there, I, I know what you mean. There's something that allows you to do this, and I do not quite recall, other than. There's things like selective color, which allow you to, for instance, adjust only colors in certain areas. So I can pick only the blues in this cape and explore how I manipulate those. Um, and that can be quite fun to kind of play around with. Uh, it's not quite the same, but like if you have quite delineated sort of lights and darks, it can have similar effects. You can always go back and just continue to edit whatever you're working on when it comes to how things look. There we go. That's beautiful. Um, so now I've got my character. I've got an idea of what my character's colors are going to be. Um, I'm going to select everything by using the move tool and just dragging across. As long as I've got auto select um, and layer selected up here on the top left, it'll just select every single layer that I've got here. Um, although it doesn't seem to like selecting adjustment masks, does it? Oh, no, it's fine. There we go. Um, so everything here I've now put into a single group and I'm doing this because I want to put on top of this shadow layer. Um, so I've made a new clipping mask. I've gone in, I've got a brush that I'm going to use for shadows. I'm going to pick a shadow color, which is usually this sort of like kind of grayish, pale grayish blue up here. But again, you can kind of explore anything. And I'm going to start sort of painting these in. So I'm thinking about where the light source is. Ideally, I would have a reference for where this light source is, so I'm not just making it up. Um, but if you are making it up, keep it simple as much as possible. Don't go for really extreme uh, eight-point light systems or anything like that. Um, and use references for things that make sense. So if you know that uh, your character has got like folds in their clothes like this, Cool, let's start emphasizing those folds. Uh, use what's already there. Don't try and reinvent every single fold in the cloth necessarily. So all these shadows I'm doing, they're quite hard because I just sort of want to throw them down quite fast. You might want to spend more time doing things like this. Uh, you don't need to spend ages, but just getting a sense of where those lights and shadows are on your character can be useful. Anything where there's detail, like faces, you want to be spending a little more time because it's a point that people look at uh, versus like, you know, the heels of your shoes, which you might be able to kind of approximate. I'm not going to let you worry about the face too much for now, but... Um, it's also useful just to go back in and start kind of erasing some of the shadows that you've made, uh, figuring out kind of like, okay, where do they need to go? How do I make sure that these elements feel unified? Whatever that looks like for your character, for your character's design. Uh, even things like legs, arms, uh, if there's muscle, cool, how does the muscle affect the light and shadow. This isn't knowledge that you're born with innately. This is knowledge you need to look up for and find reference for. So please always do if you're not certain of something. Uh, you can spend a long time trying by yourself to make it look good and maybe you'll achieve it, but probably it'll take you a long time and you won't like it that much. Or you can go find reference or go take your own reference photos and achieve the exact same result in like a quarter of the time. Um, so I have a sense of shadows here that have come in. Excellent. I'm going to now make a, an adjustment layer that is going to affect everything in this image. I'm going to try color balance. And I'm going to just adjust 
all of the shadows in the image very slightly. And all of the, uh, let's see, all of the highlights, again, very slightly, just tweaking it. So as I'm doing this, you can see if I do it quite extreme, um, everything is now affected by the same layer. This means I'm starting to unify what's happening in the image uh, for better or for worse, depending on if I do a good job. Um, you can also just test, is, is it good? Is it not good? Removing things like by just like hiding and reshowing layers. You can uh, play around with things like exposure, which can help you figure out if your image is too dark, too light. Most of these you find you don't use them until like, you know, say gamma correction here helps sort of like lift up a lot of the sort of darkness that was present in the image. Um, and that can be quite useful. Uh, you can also use the, the mask function on every single one of these adjustment layers and be like, well, I want that gamma layer, but I don't want it um, in these sort of deeper shadows here. So I'm going to I'm going to erase this out by painting with black. Um, or again, whatever that might look like. So um, as you're doing this, you can then start to go new layer, making sure it's, whoops, making sure it's on top of my existing layers. Um, I can then start to go and paint into this a little bit. I could also do a light pass layer if I wanted, but for now I'm, because we have, a short amount of time, I'm just going to quickly go in and explore what happens if I start doing some actual quick painting. So different brushes, different effects. This brush, great for fabric. Love it. Really works for this. Um, I'm also picking colors as I go in. I'm, I'm, I'm just picking colors from other aspects. So this blue cape, great. How do I integrate that blue into these pants? I'm going to kind of paint it in. I'm going to sort of use it as sort of a mid shadow. Um, and I'm not doing it too much, and I'm going back over with the existing shadows that I've already established in there. But if I do it a little bit and I do it right, it helps to integrate these colors and it helps to feel like whatever light source is playing upon these particular objects is affecting all of them. And that's what you're really going for when it comes to photo comping, is you're taking like a dozen different things and you're saying, how do I make people believe these are all on the same character or in the same space or whatever that might be? And there's a variety of ways you can achieve this um, and to a variety of different results. But if you are interested in this sort of like kind of how do you how do you paint over aspect, um, a lot of it is borrowing these colors and letting them affect each other. Um, and again, I'm doing enormous amounts of just using the color picker here to feel out what colors I want. And that means that sometimes there's sort of smudges of other colors left in there. I like this effect. Some people don't. Uh, it depends on kind of like the level of realism you're going for uh, and kind of like what the final result is intended to be. Like with all things, you can find a way that works best for you, that lets you achieve the results you want to. And that is the best way of doing it, uh, which means that, yeah, it's different for everyone. That's fine. So as I'm doing this, I can also start to sort of like build in some of the details, like, okay, let's sort of like make up some of the folds in this shirt here. Again, I'm doing a lot of color picking, which means that as I'm, even though I'm like creating these aspects, I'm creating these folds, um, ideally they are going to feel like they still kind of belong to this object, to this character, to the space. Um, because I'm using the colors that I've already established makes sense with it. Um, and I could introduce other colors if I wanted to, if I thought it would help. Um, but doing so, you want to think about where else on your character you might want to then start to introduce those as well, uh, simply to kind of keep that feeling of things being unified. Um, and of course, there's aspects that start to come in around kind of like, okay, how do you how do you sort of achieve certain particular results uh, in terms of texture and things like that? And often the answer is it's a clipping mask or it's a blend mode layer. Um, so we can kind of explore how do you add things like that through, in general, a combo of those two factors. Um, so I can take, let's see, 
Let's see. I have some textures here. Here's a great texture. It's this fish. Look how cool this fish is, guys. Um, isn't this a cool fish? Um, it, it's some kind of sturgeon, I think. Um, I really love using photos of things that aren't the thing you're going to represent. So this fish, fantastic. Look at this amazing pattern. Um, I just imported this image in, let's say. Um, currently, this image has this little box in the corner, which means it's not rasterized. Um, I can fix this by either right-clicking on it and telling it I want to rasterize it, which is here, or by just tapping the image and it'll be like, you can't draw on this. What's that? No, this is the natural pattern. I love it. Oh, because I uh, file uh, place embedded, which automatically has it come in as a raster, uh, as an unrasterized image. Not sure why, always seems to be the way. Um, and it stops you editing the image in any way if you do that. So um, I've got my fish. Um, one thing I just like doing is going, okay, here's the texture I know I like. Let's just let's just see where on my character it might actually look good. Um, because you know, if I don't have a particular idea in mind, it can be fun just to kind of start exploring that. So I could go, okay, um, this allow you know, where does it show up quite nicely when I'm using, for instance, a soft light layer? Um, and as I do this, I can also start to go, okay, what else is in here? Some stuff will always pretty much have great effects. So this is normal. Okay, can we go down? Can we, we, we can't go down the way that I like, you just hover over it, which is a little weird. Um, overlay is also great. It's, it's a very strong effect, so it can be quite vibrant. Soft light always has quite a lovely natural way of applying textures and shapes. So I always recommend soft light. Um, some stuff is a little weirder and a little harder to use, like divide. Uh, it's quite fun for kind of like helping find shapes and elements. It's less fun for pure photo comping. Um, this is another one, subtract, that I really enjoy, um, but you have to use it quite sparingly, as you can see, or else it kind of disrupts the image. Um, same for things like this, where this makes a really fun sense of pattern and shape and texture, but I've lost all of the shading in there because it no longer is going to make sense, really with what I've put down because of the way it affects light and shadow. Um, so I could either keep this and then kind of redraw into it or um, lower the opacity and try and sort of like just keep some of that distortion. Or I could for now choose something that is a bit simpler. Um, so I might just choose to keep this on the pants layer. Um, I could use a clipping mask and put it just on this here. Um, or I can just do what I'm doing here and just erase the elements that aren't necessary. I could also just use a, a layer mask to do this exact same thing. Um, either, either of these is totally fine. It all comes down to what works best for you. Uh, layer mask allows you to continue adjusting it, um, uh, whereas this version is a little more destructive, but uh, allows for sort of some different freedoms. Um, and in any case, something like this can let you sort of start building in elements of texture, elements of shape. You can also explore, say, grabbing chunks and trying to create uh, textural effects that have, say, a sense of the cloth coming through. So things aren't just lining up perfectly, um, but have a bit of distortion. Um, again, just trying to achieve that effect of this is a pattern that's on cloth and therefore it's not going to uh, align itself perfectly. And same as always, I can just go in and play around with, oops, <laughs> um, play around with how that manifests in terms of the color of whatever the object is. Wow, that's, I think I have a shirt that looks like that. Man, that's garish. Uh, but <laughs> uh, that's the thing, um, using all of these allows you to achieve some really interesting results that you might not otherwise find yourself uh, accessing or enjoying, and that can be quite good. Um, so we're basically run out of time at this point. Um, I might leave it here with these beautiful, beautiful tie-dye pants. Uh, is there any questions? Is there anything at this point that I can answer for you guys that I might have skipped or said really fast? I hear silence. Silence, good. Um, so all of the images that I've shown you guys are in the folder on the sign-up sheet. Um, 
if you want to play around with any of these existing assets and that includes the brushes so they are all in um this the the url is on the sign up sheet but they're all in this folder here um so the two documents that i've been working on here today are just these ones this is a word document that is just looking at where do you find things it links to the museum it links to a place that does human poses stock images um, and the website in which i grabbed a bunch of screenshots again all of this stuff is things you can kind of use at your leisure if you want here's a bunch of cutout images just for kind of ease of access that i have here um, basically for these tutorials um, and miscellaneous which is just textures and things that seemed cool to me uh, Again, you guys probably have your own sort of folders of like, you know, references you like, things like that. If not, I really, I, I encourage you guys to actually start building those, like get a folder and just save every image you think is cool and maybe even categorize them slightly. Uh, but yeah, so everything's here, including brushes, which is in here. This is every single brush I've managed to collect over the years and it's quite a big download. Don't know if it's good. Um, these are these are the standard ones that I use. There's like 10 brushes in here. Um, you also can use your own brushes. You should share your own brushes if you have some and you want to and you want other people to know about them and have a good time. Um, or you can keep them to yourself. It's all good either way. But uh, in the meantime, I think it's probably time for you guys to go eat for the most part. Um, I'm going to hang around a little bit and just sort of like check in on how people are doing and stuff. So if you do want to stay and chat or ask me anything, please go ahead uh otherwise thank you guys for coming along to a tutorial at 6 p.m okay. good on you guys <laughs>